So my name is uh, Jennifer Carr, and I work here at BarMax. Um, before that, I taught at various law schools, doing bar prep stuff, uh, teaching bar prep, running bar prep programs, all of that kind of thing um, for 12 years. So um, this is... Uh, uh, where I, where I am now. And I love it. Um, and there's lots of things to love about bar max. Um, but I, I think one of the things I enjoy about it most is it's definitely, uh, I would say, uh, you know, we are interested in, um, working with folks who may be, um, coming to a career in the legal field in a non-traditional way. Um, you know, when I went to law school, if you wanted to do bar prep, that meant sitting in a big seminar hall and getting talked at, by a video on like legitimately like, a, you know, a, what do you call those things? VCR cassette tape thing. Um, I don't even remember what they're called now. Uh, video, like legitimately a videotape. Um, and the idea that you could, you know, learn the material you needed for the bar through an app on your phone. What? That was not even a thing any, any of us even thought about. Um, and so I love the, I love, love being associated with the company that's really taking the, the cutting edge there. And I think it's uniquely um, situated to work with um, those of you who may also be taking an alternate path to licensure uh, in California here um, for the, uh, uh, um, your bar license. Um, so I, that being said, kind of introducing myself, talking a little bit about the program. Uh, if any of you are here and you're thinking, what the heck is the FYL? What are all those initials? Um, this is also sometimes called the baby bar. And uh, for those folks who may be going to a school that is not accredited by the ABA or the California um, bar accrediting associate or, you know, bar law school accrediting association, there we go, um, then you're going to be required to take uh, uh, an exam that is designed to cover those first year topics, you know, torts, contracts, uh, and criminal law. And it really is uh, very similar to the so-called general bar exam that everybody takes prior to becoming an attorney, uh, in that you are doing multiple choice questions. Um, but instead of doing 200 multiple choice questions, you're doing 100. Um, you are doing essays, but instead of doing five essays over, you know, a, a 14 topics, you're doing four essays over um, three topics. So um, there are some real similarities there. Um, so if anybody is here and you're watching this and you're thinking, uh, wait, what, <laughs> what is that? Um, this is, this is, I don't, do I have to do that? I don't know if I have to do that. Um, that's what it is. That's why we take it. Um, that's what it's for. Um, but today is about what do you do when you get those results and they're not the results you want? Um, and how do we recover from that? How do we, how do we say, okay, this was the experience I had, but how do I, how do I make that? Um, even better? How do I uh, build from that experience and create um, an experience that, that will allow me to uh, become successful in my, um, you know, in, in my future um, career path? And uh, I do have some thoughts about that. I do have some thoughts about that. So we're going to talk about that here. So, you know, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was how do you bounce back? How do you come back from this kind of a situation? You got, you opened up that email and, uh, you know, the results were not what you wanted. What do you do? Um, and I mean, I think we got to be honest, right? What's on everybody's minds? Kim Kardashian. Um, all over the news, I had somebody, you know, reach out to me and say, Jen, you know, can you believe that Kim Kardashian passed? Um, you know, look. Uh, yeah, I totally can't, right? Like, why shouldn't she pass? Um, for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is um, she apparently put in a ton of work on this exam to pass it. Um, you know, uh, she also is, you know, someone who has an attorney for a father. So, you know, whether she necessarily like, you know, you know, you know, uh, was thinking to herself, like intentionally, like, Hey, I want to learn as much as I can from my dad. Um, she was, I imagine picking up the language here and there. I definitely didn't have that as a kid, right? Like my parents were not attorneys. I know, you know, I don't know what any of that stuff was. Um, 
She also, you know, has run her own business and has been very successful. And so one has to imagine she has some practical experience with contracts and negotiations. Um, you know, being someone who markets and sells products, one has to imagine that she has at least a passing familiarity with products liability. Um, and she's richer than Croesus, right? So she can afford to do a lot of things that the rest of us may not be able to do. Um, and I also want to say, she took it four times, right? So, you know, yeah, she she did pass um, and we are proud of her and we want to celebrate her successes because, you know, hey, anybody who passes the bar exam deserves to be celebrated and deserves to be, you know, congratulated for their achievements. Um, but, you know, it, I'm not saying that for any of, oops, for any of us, that necessarily comes um, right out the gate as the thing that happens the first time you take the exam. Um, sometimes it does take multiple attempts. And if you're in that boat, that is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, you know, if it's good enough for, for Kim K, it can be good enough for the rest of us. Um, I also discovered that apparently Kim Kardashian is six days younger than me. <laughs> And basically what I, what I learned from that is it was very important that I put on lipstick before doing this national webinar because I do not look like Kim Kardashian. Um, so let's talk about the exam itself. And like, you know, why is it that even someone with all of the resources that Kim Kardashian has, why is it that she might need to take it four times before she can be successful? So the first thing to know is that, uh, you know, the exam rate varies, you know, a little bit here and there. You know, sometimes it's 21%, sometimes it's 23%, sometimes it's 20%. Um, but really, it's it's hovering right at about that 20% mark, which means that if five people take the exam, only one person is going to pass, one of those five people is going to pass it. Um, that's a pretty tough passage rate. Uh, and we talk about, you know, the general California exam as being very difficult. Um, and, you know, one of the metrics that we use when we're talking about why the California exam is so difficult is the idea that it is, um, you know, it has such a low pass rate. Well, I mean, the general, you know, bar exam pass rate is significantly higher than that, you know, double or triple that. Um, so it's just a difficult exam. And separate and apart from whatever objective measure of difficulty you might want to look at with it, um, you know, you could look at its length, you could look at um, its depth, you could look at the passage rate. There's also just the fact that it's a high stakes exam. Um, so many schools will say, uh, so you're not allowed, California um, examiners say, you know, you don't get credit for study past your first year if you uh, don't pass the exam. Um, and many schools uh, sort of take that and say, therefore, we're not going to allow you to continue studying past your first year. So it's a high, in addition to the fact that like just whichever metric you want to use, uh, you know, the passage rate. The fact that it's a long exam, it lasts an entire day, um, the subjects that are covered, you know, like we talk about it as being three subjects, but within each of those subjects, there's actually like multiple layers, right? So there's intentional torts and negligence and products liability and defamation and, you know, all of these different pieces. Um, there's also the fact that it's just a high stakes exam. So, uh, you know, the rules, uh, the California rules say that um, you are not uh, to be given credit for any study that you do uh, after the first year until you have passed your uh, first year law students exam, um, which some schools have interpreted to mean that they will not allow students to continue to um, study past that that first year. Uh, so, you know, it's it's not just a question of future career success. It may also be a question of, can I even continue my um, educational career? So there's just a lot of pressure around it on a lot of us too. Um, so, you know, I want to acknowledge that, you know, look, uh, every year you're going to hear about people who were or were not successful. Um, and you want to look at that and kind of take it for what it is. It is um, an example of one person who achieves success through a particular method. And your job is to say, what can I take from that and personalize and create for my own self to create my own success? Um, so I've got kind of a, a three-part plan for you. Um, the first one is super simple, just feel your feelings. Um, the second one is analyzing your results. And we're going to actually look at, okay, so I got this results 
document, like email thing, like what does it mean? Um, and then step three is, okay, based on what my results showed, what do I do? What's my next step? So the first thing that I'm going to say to you is you get to feel whatever you feel. And I would say, don't be judgmental or harsh with yourself about that. Um, you know, you may feel angry. You may feel sad. You may be disappointed. You may be disappointed in yourself. You may feel frustrated with other folks. You may feel frustrated with the uh, bar examiners. You may think to yourself, I should be grateful that I had the opportunity to take this exam. Um, I shouldn't be so sad about this. Um, I ought to feel, you know, uh, more, you know, excited to take it again. Um, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't bring all those shoulds and ought tos into it. Just leave those out and just acknowledge where you are. Um, I don't want you to get stuck in your feelings. So, you know, sometimes it works really well to kind of take a day or two and just like, just be sad. Like if that's where you're at, like if you need to just sit down and like eat some ice cream and watch some TV and cry, like do what you need to do. If you're angry and you need to just run it out, like go do that. Um, if you need to like talk to a friend and just vent about how frustrating this is, do what you need to do. Um, and if you find that this is taking more than a couple of days to kind of work through, another uh, thing that sometimes works is to set, to set aside some time, like a little bit of time, you know, 20-ish um, minutes uh, during the day to just kind of have whatever emotions you're having, you know, like, hey, this is my time to process what I'm feeling about the bar exam. And it kind of sounds silly to be like, hey, I'm going to like make an appointment to um, have these feelings. But but what it does is it kind of kind of tricks your brain a little bit and tells your brain like, hey, you know, stop reminding me when I'm trying to study that I'm really frustrated about this stupid exam and the fact I have to take it again. Um, and instead uh, convinces your brain that, you know, okay, we can, we can wait for that interruption because this is not the time for that. Um, and the other thing that I would say is just know that you're not alone, right? Like I think sometimes this can feel so isolating. Am I the only one? Does anybody else have this experience? What else is, is going on? Um, what's happening? Like where, where even am I? Like what I feel like, like, and there almost can be this sense of like just loneliness. Um, you're not alone. I promise. I promise you, you know, um, in fact, the, again, the majority of people, like 80% of the people who took this exam, um, did not pass. Uh, and so that just, you know, mathematically, that means you're not alone. This is a difficult exam. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly there may be things that you can do and change and alter in order to allow yourself to be more successful this next time around. And that's what we're going to talk about, um, in just a second here. But in the meantime, it's okay to, to uh, just have those feelings and know that other folks are feeling the same way. Um, so with that, let's talk about how we do that analysis. Like, what does that look like? When I talk about, okay, your next step is to analyze your results. You know, what, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? How do I do that? So the first thing that I'm going to say is this dreaded, this dreaded document, right, that we get. Um, and, uh, here I have, uh, sort of blinked everything out. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we know that the first line, if, if you were not, if you did not pass, the first line says, we regret to inform you that you were unsuccessful, which is, you know, that's unfortunate, um, blinked everything else out. Uh, and then I'm going to suggest that we start at the bottom and I'm going to walk us through this chart and like what it means and how you can kind of interpret it. Um, and I may come back to this slide again and again to kind of remind us, and then we'll fill in the next part and look at that too. So um, you've got this total scaled score um, and the total possible scaled score is 800 and you have to get at least 560 to pass. So here in our hypothetical like candidate that we're using, um, I have taken their total scaled score and replaced it with a 560, which is what is required to pass. Um, but that score is reported out of 800. So, you know, hey, you could get, you know, ostensibly you could get an 800. I've never heard of that, but you could get an 800 um, or you could get a 600 and that would be passing. So anything at or above that 560 is gonna get you over the threshold. 
So the next thing that you want to know is that 560 can come from any combination of scores on your multiple choice and your essays. Um, they're weighted equally. So 50% essay, 50% multiple choice. So you could very easily get a 280 on both. And in our little hypothetical applicant situation, that's what I've done. So I've said, hey, they got a 280 on the multiple choice and they got a 280 on the um, uh, written portion as well. And I'm going to talk about what converted and scale, like what all those words mean. But for now, just know 50% to each. Um, in my ideal world, like if I were in charge of the world, I would say to you, hey, I want you to get, you know, I want you to aim for at least a 280 on both halves. Um, but, you know, you don't have to. Um, you could have, uh, you know, a um, 300 on your essays and a 260 on your multiple choice. So, you know, if you are someone where you're like, hey, I'm a pretty good writer, you know, that can give you a little bit of wiggle room on the multiple choice. Or alternatively, if you're like, I am not great at essay writing, but I am pretty good at the multiple choice, you can use that for some wiggle room. Now, I remember at the beginning, I did say, hey, um, this is actually pretty similar to what you're going to do on uh, the general bar exam. So this will help guide you through that process and, um, you know, help you prepare for it. So, you know, again, you want to try to get as good, you know, get get to be as good as you can be at both of these uh, sections. But, um, you know, you do have some flexibility there. All right. Um, once you've kind of thought about that, like, what does it mean if one side is particularly higher or lower than the other side? Um, and this sounds super obvious, but you would be surprised. Sometimes people, you know, we get it in our heads that like, we're not good at the multiple choice. Um, but then it turns out, you know, actually your multiple choice isn't bad. Um, so definitely take a look at that. And I would say, you know, I would say look for, for two things. The first thing that I would say is, um, are you seeing a big discrepancy there? So if you're seeing that one side is clearly stronger than the other, I do want you to try to address that gap. I want you to try to close it to the extent you can. So if you're seeing that like, hey, there's a, you know, 80 point difference between where I'm at with my multiple choice versus where I am with my essays, I want you to try to close that gap. But also, um, if you're seeing that, uh, you know, uh, um, one side is, you know, just at that 280 and one is much lower or something like that, um, or you're just like super, let's say that one side is at, you know, I don't know, something you know, lower and, and, and you've done quite well in another side, uh, that also just gives you that information of, hey, uh, you know, you're better at one of these skills. You're either better at the writing or better at the multiple choice. Now, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to take that information and say, well, I'm better at the writing than I am at the multiple choice. So I'm just going to focus on multiple choice. I mean, yes, I do want you to focus more on multiple choice, but you still have to maintain the um, gains that you've made on the essay portion. So it's it's how do I maintain the level that I'm at with the essays while bringing up the multiple choice? So it's how do I stay equal with both? So um, as we can see, our model applicant brought it up there to 280 on both sides. Um, now let's talk about that whole scaling thing. So the first thing about scaling is it's kind of using the magic of math to try to make each essay uh, the same amount of difficulty as every other essay. So that if you get, you know, a torts question that's particularly difficult or you get a, um, I don't know what you get, you get a contracts question that's really easy. Um, they're still hopefully, you know, being uh, count, you know, given the same amount of, of credit in terms of the way that they're, they're scored. So the scaling kind of helps to even that out. Um, it also should hopefully uh, keep it the same amount of difficulty from year to year, because the essays are essentially being matched to the multiple choice, which is objective. Um, 
if you're super curious, if you're like, I love math and I want to know more, uh, the California Bar website actually has the single best explanation of scaling that I've ever seen. So if, if that's something you want to know more about, go check it out. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, uh, definitely once you've kind of looked at the, um, the essays uh, and you've thought about, okay, so what are, what are these scaled scores? Um, there's four essays and, you know, once they're scaled, they could be worth up to a hundred points. Um, this is also pretty similar to the way the bar exam is scaled. Um, theoretically, you could get a hundred points on an essay. I've never seen that. Um, like I said, I've been doing this, you know, uh, Gosh, I said 12 years earlier, but it's actually 16 years. See, this is why I'm not, why I'm just like, why I just say the magic of math rather than trying to do the math with you. Um, but I've never seen somebody get 100, 100 points. Is it possible? Absolutely. But I've just never seen it. Um, you could get a 40 on an essay, uh, but that's pretty rare too. A 40 is kind of reserved for someone who, who opens it up and they write something, but it's not quite... Um, on point or it's not really useful, right? You opened it up and, and you wrote, why did I decide to become a lawyer? I should have stayed a dog walker. I was much happier then, right? And the bar examiners are like, well, we, we're going to give you points for realizing that, that this is a test to become a lawyer, 40 points. Um, most of us, we're going to be somewhere between a 50 and an 80, okay? Um, in general, I want you to be aiming for about a 70. Again, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. You know, if you get a 55 on one essay and an 85 on another, skinny average up to, to a 70, that's fine. Um, but in general, I want you to aim for a 70. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's a little bit of, uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, do, do I wanna say maybe foolhardy or it's a little bit, um, challenge, um, yeah, maybe foolhardy to, to like plan that like, Hey, I'm not great at crim. So I'm going to hope that I get, you know, an 85 on my torts. And you know, we just don't know for sure that that's going to happen. What if you have an off day? So I'm going to say you're aiming for a 70 across the board. Um, and again, we're shooting for that 270, um, or, you know, 280, right. But remember it's going to get scaled. So when it gets scaled, and again, magic and math, um, what is going to happen is we're going to add like eh, somewhere between 10 and 15 points. So this person, you know, they've got 70s on pretty much everything except SA2, where they got a 60. Um, I told them not to count on not getting, you know, that tort subject. What were they thinking? So they got a 270. Eh, I don't love it, but okay. Um, so, however... Uh, that's their total raw written because we just take all these scores and add it up. Once it was scaled, it scaled out to a 280. Whew, thank goodness. Um, would have liked them to have a little bit more wiggle room there, but they just barely made it because of the scaling. Um, so what does all that mean? Like if I was looking at that and I saw three essays at a 70 and one at a 60, what would I tell that applicant? So you know, one thing I would say is, hey, that essay that you got the lower score on, that makes me think that that particular area of law might be an area of weakness. So if I'm seeing some essays where you're doing very well and some essays where you're doing poorly, um, that tells me this is not an essay writing problem. That skill of, of writing the good essay seems to be well within your grasp. Um, but instead, uh, it may be a knowledge problem and it's particular to whatever area of law was tested on that question. In which case, you gotta, you know, focus on learning that area of law. Um, if you're getting consistently low scores on the essays, just like across the board, you're like, hey, I'm at a 55 across the board, just 55, 55, 55, 55. Um, then that's a situation where I would say, well, um, I think your essay writing is actually what's the problem here. Um, and it may not be what you know or don't know. And this is something that's a little bit unfair about the bar exam and 
It's true of the baby bar and the general bar exam. Um, sometimes it's not so much about what you know, but it's about, you know, can you convey it back to the bar examiners in a way that they're going to reward you for? And it's about having that nice, clean IRAC and doing a really thorough um, application of the law to the facts. Uh, and this is a skill that you can work on and you can build. So consistently low scores across the board, particularly if combined with a higher multiple choice score, because the higher multiple choice score would say, yeah, you do have the law. It's the essay writing that's the problem. And the essay writing is low across the board. It's an essay writing issue. Um, if you have um, consistently, you know, high scores, but they're just not quite enough to get you over that hump. So it's instead of, you know, that 70, 70, 70, 70, 70, you got 65, 65, 65, 70. That would suggest to me that your knowledge is kind of here. You're kind of at the surface of it. Or maybe, you know, it's the surface plus a little bit in certain areas when I need you to delve deeper. So if you're looking at that score sheet and it's like, well, you know, they're just close to a 70, um, but it's just not quite getting there. Um, that could be an issue of not having enough knowledge uh, of the detail itself. Um, okay, so that's essays for you. Um, in re regards to the multiple choice questions. Um, so there's going to be 100 multiple choice questions. There's three subjects. So they're going to divide them up into 33, 33, 34. Um, you know, it's conceivably possible you could get all 100 questions correct. Um, I have never seen that, but mathematically that is a possibility. Um, on the other hand, we would presume that if all you did was to mark the letter choice C all the way down, uh, you should get, you know, 25% correct. Um, most of you are going to be somewhere between those two areas. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is, you, you know, you, you kind of want to aim for 24-ish questions correct in each of those three areas, right? So you're, you're kind of looking for um, a 72, right? Um, you could be a little bit lower. You could, you know, you could be closer to a 70. Um, but, you know, really uh, kind of, kind of, again, because we want to kind of match them up, you want to be at that 70 or a little bit above in that multiple choice in terms of your percentage there, right? So um, they're going to take the number of questions that you got correct. They're going to multiply it um, by the, you know, here, you know, assuming you got 24 on each of the three subject areas, um, then they're going to multiply it by four, and that's going to give you 288. Or if you got 23 uh, questions correct on two subject areas and 24 on one subject area, that gives you a 280 when you multiply it by four. And so now our applicants, you know, um, uh, score sheet would look something like this, right? So their total raw multiple choice is a 70. We multiplied it by four to get the converted multiple choice of 280. And because, because those two things match, you know, or, or uh, add up to, um, you know, the converted multiple choice and the scaled add up to a 560, we've got a passing uh, score there. Um, so let's say that it's the other way. Um, let's say that you're doing super well on those multiple choice. Like you are, you're like 70, come on lady, I'm getting like 80s. Um, okay, that tells me it's your essay writing. Let's work on that. Let's see what we can bring up there. Um, on the other hand, if your essays are, you know, if you're looking at this answer choice and your scale written is at 300, um, but your multiple choice is at 200, that tells me you got to work on that multiple choice. Um, I would also say, look at the subjects themselves. So, you know, can you see that, uh, hey, I really struggle with torts. Um, and this is particularly true if you can look at it across both multiple choice and essay questions. And for those of you who are what we call persisters, so you're not just repeaters, you're not like just taking this for the second time. You like Kim Kardashian are a persister, you're taking it for the third or fourth time or more times. Um, then uh, that gives you some really valuable data because you can say, do I always struggle with torts? Like, is torts just like a weakness for me? Is there something that I can do to address that? Um, 
I know I just threw like a whole bunch of like numbers y kind of stuff at you. We will take questions later on, um, but you also can chat us questions. Celeste and Katie are here. They're happy to take questions in the chat while I just keep yammering on, um, or uh, you can uh, ask questions later on. So, so yeah, if you have a question, don't feel like we're not going to answer it. So once you've got your, your, um, kind of, okay, I'm not great at multiple choice and seems like I'm pretty good at contracts and crim, but torts need some work. Now it's time to make a plan. How do I get better at that then? What do I do? So the first thing that I would say is, you know, hey, is this like a knowledge problem? Is this a, you know, you need to get better at crim because you just, you don't know the law. Um, most of the time, if you ask folks like, hey, how do you, how do you learn something? They'll tell you like, well, you know, I read and reread the outlines. I read and reread the outlines. I listen to the lectures. Most of us learn much more through active learning and the more active, the better. So the gold standard is going to be practice questions. So, you know, plenty of questions in bar max, um, but honestly, like practice questions, that is the that, that's what you need, man, um, because that's going to do so many things at once. It's going to help you learn the law. Like, oh, I didn't really understand. That's what, you know, um, tortious liability for the acts of another meant until I saw it in the October 2021 question. Um, you learned the law or you learn how the law is tested. Oh, they like to ask about the difference between, you know, uh, employees and independent contractors. Okay, like, let's talk about that. Now I know this is a thing to look out for. Um, and you also uh, learn some of those skills, like, okay, how do I, how do I write about what I know? Um, but that being said, don't feel like essay writing is, you know, the only way to do this. Um, if you don't have an hour to set aside, you could outline an essay question. That should take you 15 to 20 minutes. You don't have 15 to 20 minutes, you could do some flashcards. Um, we have some uh, uh, flashcards in our program that you could use, but you could also make your own. Um, don't be afraid to like bring your partners in and your kids in and your parents in. And let me tell you that non-law trained um, folks quizzing you, they will hold you to what is written on that card. <laughs> If you say, you know, uh, oh, you know, oh, yeah, that's fraud. They'll say uh, mm, the card says intentional misrepresentation. And you try convincing them that that means the same thing. They'll be like, mm, no. So they're really going to help you make sure you get that vocab down. Um, but you also can make charts or graphs or flow charts or compare contrast charts or anything really that is like taking that material and making it your own and saying like, okay, how can I use this material and manipulate it and uh, um, structure it in a way that makes it my own information? I've learning more about what the law is and also how it's tested. Um, what if it was the skills problem? So what if you're the person where you say, okay, my issue is really the multiple choice questions or my issue is really the essay writing. So the first thing that I would say is, man, this is going to shock you. You got to practice, right? I was like, literally just like, hey, you got to practice. You got to practice. Um, and what I would say is, uh, you know, do that open book practice untimed at first. I don't want you to even worry about time. Um, you know, you're answering that, mul that multiple choice question and you're like, well, I mean, it could be larceny by fraud, but it also could maybe be embezzlement. And you go, you know, um, either, you know, flip through the book or go to the um, uh, app and you find it in there. Uh, that actually just helps you remember it better. Um, or alternatively, if you're writing the essay and you're like, hey, I'm pretty sure this is embezzlement. But what exactly is the rule for that again? Go look it up. Hold yourself accountable for applying each and every one of those elements. Make sure that you're demonstrating that skill. Um, and then what I would say, a lot of folks hearing that are like, uh, I don't know, open book, untimed. Um, but remember, you're using this to uh, learn the law and also to learn the skill of how to convey um, what you know, whether that's multiple choice or uh, essays. Um, and you can uh, uh, um, sort of wean yourself off of that extra time and the open book uh, um, practice 
over time as you get closer and closer to the exam, while hopefully maintaining that same quality of writing or multiple choice scores as you, as you were. Um, let's say that like, it's not either of those things. And you're like, Jen, listen, that score sheet you showed was really great. Um, but I know what the problem was. Friend got married. Um, my kid ended up in the hospital. Um, there was the devastating fire throughout the state of California. And then there were floods all while a worldwide pandemic was going on. Just whatever, you know, um, something happened. Or what if you're someone who has a disability? Or you are a full-time caregiver to kids or parents or both, those of us in the sandwich generation. Um, or you're working full-time or both. What do you do then? Like, what does that look like? How do you achieve success on this exam when you have pressure coming at you from all of those sides? So the first thing that I would say is you want to be really, really specific with your study schedule. So, um, you know, we, we will obviously give you a schedule um, and, and you're welcome to just follow that if that's what works for you. Um, but I would also say, don't be afraid to personalize to what your own needs are. Um, so, you know, ask yourselves like, hey, have I done this question before? Would it be better to do a different question? Okay, what question am I going to do? Um, and I would say you want to be as specific as possible. So, um, you know, for me, if I write, um, I don't know, what am I going to write? I'm going to write study torts. Sure. I'm going to open up the app and I'm going to turn on my, my go to, to the torts lecture and I'm going to listen to it for a minute. And then I'm going to decide I need a cup of coffee and I'll go to get my cup of coffee. And while I'm over there, I'm going to decide that, you know, really I should probably empty and reload the dishwasher. And while I'm putting away the clean dishes, I'm going to realize we're out of tea and I don't really want tea yet, but I probably will want tea later. And so I'll go to the grocery store and suddenly there's not time for that anymore. Right. So having those, um, you know, and, we all have, have heard this acronym, but it's a cliche for a reason. Those, you know, smart, you know, um, um, specific, measurable, achievable, reasonable, timely goals uh, can really help. So what does that look like when you're preparing for the bar? You know, say to yourself, hey, I'm going to do 10 multiple choice questions from 9 to 9.30 p.m. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, what the heck, Jen? I should be able to do 10 multiple choice questions in 20 minutes, less than 20 minutes, 18 minutes. See? See with the math, I can do the math. Um, sure, but remember you're doing this open book study. And even if you're not, you're going to want time to check it. Um, and I would say you want to have, you know, you want to really feel free to make this your own. Um, so does this look like, you know, uh, you know, talking with someone earlier today who said, look, I actually feel really great about CRIM. Like I've done, studied CRIM a lot. I feel really good about it, but I need some extra time with contracts. All right. Let's get you some extra time with contracts then, right? Um, so think about this as kind of being a template or being building blocks that you can then sort of rebuild and re-put together in a way that best makes sense to you. Um, I also want you to think about where you're going to study. So similarly, talking with an applicant uh, earlier this week who um, he and his uh, wife and daughter foster uh, puppies. So they had just gotten a new puppy into the house super cute, but noisy. Um, meanwhile, um, partner's mom was kind of in her final days. And so they had brought partner's mom to the home to, to be with loved ones. Um, but so home is just kind of, kind of, um, chaotic right now. And so this individual said, okay, I'm going to go to the public library and I'm going to study there which seems like a good idea until you get there and you realize that like, okay, the internet doesn't work um, without like certain additional accoutrement. Um, and so, okay, like, where are you going to study? Think about when you're going to study. Um, I've shared this story before, but, you know, after I'd been barred and then teaching at law schools and all that, I decided, well, I want to go take uh, another bar exam. I think I'll take California bars, take California's bar exam. Um, but uh, I'm going to have to fit it in around my work schedule. So what I'll do is I'll get up at, you know, five in the morning and study from five to six thirty. And then when the kids get up, I'll get them ready, drop them off at school by eight and be at work by eight thirty or nine. 
that would work fine. Folks, I am not a morning person. I've never been a morning person. Let me tell you that I think that happened twice. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes our idea is like, well, you know, I just need to stop being so lazy and I just need to get out of that bed and get to work. Well, I mean, there's some truth to that, right? Like, do not train yourself to be asleep, you know, at 9 a.m. when they're giving the baby bar. Like, don't do that. But, you know, if you know that, like, you do your heaviest lifting at 2 p.m., schedule your hardest tasks for then. If you know that the time that your house is going to be quiet and you're going to have, you know, the ability to study is 9 p.m., schedule your hardest task, tasks for then. Um, think about what you need to study. You know, so I will tell you guys right now, I have a space heater because I'm one of those people who is always cold. Um, my kids think that's ridiculous, but I love it. I'm also a big fan of all my different colored pens. I got my pink pen, I got my purple pen, um, but these are things that I use. They makes, it makes it more pleasant for me. Um, and they have meaning for me when I'm, when I'm doing work or I'm researching things that helps me kind of keep things separate. Um, but so yeah, have those nice pens, have the highlighters, have the whiteboards. It's like trying to be the cook who's trying to prepare Thanksgiving dinner and you don't have the tools you need. Or I suppose like being the, I guess, craftsman who's trying to build something and you don't have the tools you need. Um, I think sometimes we get in this attitude of like, I failed um, and I'm a failure and therefore I don't deserve a nice workspace. So I'm just going to study down here in the basement in the dark where it's cold and there's mold and that's all I deserve. That is not going to motivate you to study. You're not going to study there. That doesn't sound fun. No one wants to do that. Ask yourself, what do I need to make sure I can study in this study space? Um, and that's everything from, do I study better with a little background noise? Some of us do. Do I need absolute quiet? Do I study better in the morning? Do I study better at night? Do I study better, you know, in an area that's free of visual distraction? Do I like to have, you know, my pictures up around me? Um, but create a space and an area that is your bar prep space and um, just figure out kind of what works for you. There really isn't a magic bullet. You're going to get tons of advice, right? I've spent the past 45 minutes giving you advice. Um, your friend who passed the bar exam is going to give you advice. Your friend who didn't pass the bar exam is going to give you advice. Um, but ultimately, the only magic bullet is the one that works for you. Um, we talked about that. The one magic bullet, honestly, is practice. And that is practicing those multiple choice questions and practicing the essay questions. If you do nothing else, if you walk out today and you're like, yeah, that was nice. Jen seems like a nice lady. Yeah. Um, remember, practice, 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 practice. That, if you do nothing else, that will make a big, big difference for you. For you. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, like Kim Kardashian has like an unlimited budget. And she apparently this last round hired two professors to like tutor her four hours a day, uh, every day. Most of us mortals are not going to do that, but there is tutoring available and it's, you know, relatively reasonably priced, right? You don't have to be Kim Kardashian to afford this. So if you just want me to sit down and look at your scores with you and say, Hey, um, this is what I think you need to work on, or let's build a study schedule. You know, we are, we, we can be available for an hour. Um, we can be available for 10 hours. It can be like, Hey, let's spend three hours on torts. Let's spend three hours on contracts. Let's spend three hours on something else. Um, I mean, something else on crim, right? Obviously, but, but you get where I'm going anyway, tons of packages. Um, and Hey, by the way, uh, you know, you don't have to use all these hours right now. So one thing that you could do would be to say, um, I'm going to buy, you know, some other package and I'm going to uh, hold on to those hours um, for when I'm going to go take the general bar exam, or I'm going to hold on to those hours and uh, use it in addition to the um, supplement course. Um, now, some of this stuff won't apply to you. Like, obviously, you know, you probably don't care about the con law or, you know, um, crimes or torts outlines, but or I said con law, contracts, crimes or torts outlines, but you probably do care about the con law and the civ pro. Um, you might care about the case and its legal briefs. You might care about the Emanuel's law in a flash, super reasonably priced at $25 a month. And you can combine it with the, whoops, there we go, with the um, 
with the tutoring uh, to, for like tutoring during classes and such. So, you know, I've got some folks who, who I worked with through the first year law students exam last time around. Uh, and now, uh, you know, we just finished talking about community property. So, you know, those are, those are options that are available to you. Um, but I think if you take away nothing else, like I said, uh, really focus on what your individual needs are and how, what you need to be successful and practicing because that is the key. Um, and then I will say our last step in our, in our process here is obviously for you to pass. Um, so with that, I wanted to go ahead and open it up. And if you guys have questions, you can uh, um, feel free to, to throw them in the, I think it's the Q&A, right, Katie? Yes, Q&A. Q&A. And happy to answer them there if you like, um, or, or if you have um, I guess I don't know what you would have other than questions, but yeah, if you have questions. Seems like some folks are, oh, we got, we've got a question. Yay. Mm, so Marva says, how do I overcome a mental block during an exam? I love that question, Marva. That's such a good question. Um, so, um, hmm. So the, I'll be honest with you, um, even like psychology and science and all that, we don't 100% um, percent, like know the answer to that, um, but we do have some pretty good data about what works. So there are two things that work. So one is a strategy called over-preparation. Um, so over-preparation, and I'm speaking specifically about test anxiety. We'll talk about, I'll talk about anxiety more generally in a second. Um, but for test anxiety, so test anxiety is, you know, that's the situation of you open up the exam and, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's the blinking cursor and like, I don't know what I'm supposed to type and like, oh, is this even in English? Like, what, what am I supposed to write here? Ah, my palms are sweaty. I can't breathe. Sort of that test anxiety. Um, so strategy number one is what we call over preparation. And this is where, you know, the average guy, you know, maybe they only need this amount of preparation. But if you are someone who has this kind of anxiety, you might need this amount of preparation plus some. Uh, and we just sort of accept that there's going to be a little bit of attrition. So this is this is not a situation where you are necessarily, um, you know, uh, um, going to practice until you get it right. You're definitely one of those people where you're going to practice till you get it right. And then also a few more times. Um, we also know that for folks who have test anxiety, practicing under exam-like conditions is essential. Um, now, what those exam-like conditions are, you know, you're going to just simulate them as, as much as you can. Um, but for you guys, uh, bringing in those timed conditions, you, you know, we said earlier, open book, untimed, slowly wean yourself off that extra time. Um, for you guys, you want to make sure you're giving yourself, I would say at least three weeks, maybe even a little bit more of practicing under exam conditions. Uh, and it's almost like any other phobia where you're kind of exposing yourself. You know, like if you're afraid of spiders, um, you know, your psychiatrist might be like, your psychologist might be like, Hey, here's the picture of a spider. And, you know, um, here's a, the opportunity to like, look at a spider in the zoo. And like, now we're going to look at the spiders, you know, up close and you kind of just desensitize to it. So same kind of thing here. You're going to continue to do this under exam conditions until you feel kind of less anxious around it. Um, you may also have, so, and, and I, I think that will hopefully help with some of the exam, like, mental block. Ah, what am I doing? Um, I would also say um, there's all, kind of just like general anxiety. Uh, and those, some of those techniques can be useful for test anxiety as well. So one of the common ones is um, um, that, that uh, uh, um, a lot those of us who have anxiety that, that we sometimes will engage in is uh, what's called catastrophizing, right? Um, so, um, you know, I was talking with uh, one of my children the other night and I was saying, you know, well, I'm just, I'm just worried that like, you know, am I doing this thing the right way, blah, blah, blah. I and mean, I'm being a good mom. And they're like, oh, please mom, come on. Like, just because you do this thing, um, you know, that makes you a bad mom. But that's an example of countering that catastrophizing thought with a counter thought. So that's something else you can do. 
And you can do that during an exam as well, right? So if you have that, oh my gosh, why did I think I wanted to be a lawyer? I would be so much happier being a dog walker. Why did I even decide to try this? Stop, give yourself something else to think about. The last thing that I would say is to the extent you can develop automaticity, so um, almost being able to do this without thinking about it, um, by having checklists, by having roadmaps, by having just kind of formulas that you apply, the better off you're going to be. So I hope that answered your question. Um, so uh, then I see we have a question about, you said some programs will not permit you to continue if the baby bar is not passed. So um, so, uh, so first of all, I definitely don't want to speak out of turn. So please do not think I'm speaking for all or even most programs. You should definitely talk with your individual program to find out about that. Um, but yes, there are some schools that will say, you know, hey, here's your first year of school. Um, take the, the class, do what you need to do. Uh, and once you've passed your, your baby bar, come back to us. Uh, and that's simply because the... Um, the uh, uh, California rules say that you don't get credit for any education that you've done past the first year until you get past the baby bar. So the idea there is like, let's make sure you pass the baby bar before we have you taking more classes. So for specifics on that, I would go to your individual program. Um, L. Davis says, what do you think about extra time if you've been diagnosed with test anxiety? So that is something I've heard of in regards to the baby bar. So um, you want to keep in mind that this would have to be a disability. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking for um, the same kinds of things that, that we would look for with any other um, uh, disability application, right? So uh, under, you know, if you, if you were at work, right, and you needed to sit down because you had a backache, uh, not, you know, not just a backache, you had a backache because of some you know, disability that, that impacted your, you know, what we would call activities of daily living, um, then, you know, your boss would be entitled to ask, you know, like, what is the disease or problem? What are your symptoms? What accommodation are you think, seeking? And how will this um, uh, uh, accommodation address those symptoms? Um, so uh, jet, there's you can go to the State Bar website. They have tons of forms in there that you can look at and kind of get a sense of what they ask. It is somewhat invasive, so I do want you to be aware of that. They are going to ask some questions and all that, but it's it's done out of a spirit of like, okay, help us understand what your diagnosis is, what your symptoms are, and how whatever you're asking for is going to help you. Um, they generally do want your uh, treating um doctor to uh, uh, talk about your illness and like how it impacts you. Uh, and they're pretty open about who and what that can be. Um, so, you know, could be a psychiatrist, could be a psychologist in your case, uh, or I guess whoever you may be asking for someone else, but um, for someone who has a, a, a test anxiety um, that, that is a diagnosed learning disability or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's not going to be your acupuncturist. On the other hand, if you had like some kind of a back condition and you needed to bring your, you know, special back pillow into the exam with you, you might get a note from your chiropractor and, and have him fill out that form. And that would be totally fine. So um, I would say it does take a little bit of time. Be prepared for that. Um, be prepared to get all the forms filled out. Um, they will tend to be, I mean, they ask a lot of questions. Be ready for that too. Um, and I would say the number one thing that they're going to want to know is um, if you haven't used accommodations before, why not? Um, and in any case, like, you know, why are you using accommodate? Like, what is special that you need these accommodations now? That kind of thing. All right, folks. Well, I think I'm going to keep the um, the link open just because I know Katie and Ada are kind of working out the situation here. Um, and I will stick around and just if anyone should happen to have questions, feel free to let me know. Um, but otherwise, you know, feel free to go on about your days and, and um, we're happy to hear from you, answer any questions you might have, just reach out and let us know.